So welcome to the final Lonti meeting of the term. Um, after the holidays, uh, the idea is for us to uh, go over to Buster, which is being run by uh, Queen Mary, where there's a lot of excellent lectures. And if you haven't registered for that, I recommend that you do um, as soon as you can. And after bus step, hopefully, we'll be resuming our Lonti uh, weekly seminars. So if you have any suggestions for topics that you'd be interested in or for how we might improve this new format, uh, please get in touch with us and let us know. Um, OK, so I'm going to say a little bit in this talk about dbrains. And in particular, how we can describe dbrains in string theory using the boundary state formulas. So a lot of what I'm going to say later on is going to involve some technical calculations in string theory. But maybe it'll be useful first to uh, say a few broader words. So dbrains are a really remarkable object. Um, and Fundamentally, a lot of the progress that we have made over the past 20, 30 years, um, since 95, 96 really, is because not only are D-brains very important non-perturbative objects, you can think of them as sort of the analogs of solitons or sometimes instantons, very nice. um, they are important because they're really easily described in uh, string theory. As you'll see just now, we'll be writing down essentially certain states uh, called boundary states, which capture all the dynamics of a D-brain. And it'll be relatively straightforward to calculate the scattering processes of strings with D-brains or the interactions between two or three D-brains. Now, in a normal field theory, this is an extremely hard thing to do. Normally, if you imagine doing calculations in the background of an instant on, for example, it can be done and people do these calculations, but they're very hard. And here, the incredible thing that the brains are is that they, they are non-perturbative objects. They, not quite instantons or not quite solitons, but they're that kind of an object. And yet, it's just as easy to calculate many of their quantities and physical processes involving them as it is to calculate any closed string process. So maybe I'll write down a few equations now. Uh, on my screen. Well, classical sort of picture, the picture that you should always think of when you're thinking about a D-brain is that you have some hypersurface that could have a different dimensionality. And this is your D-brain. And it's going to be a source of closed strings. Well, that means that somehow it's going to couple to, so if you start off with some closed string, that closed string can couple to the D brain. And it's this coupling, so closed strings couple to D brains. It's this coupling that will tell you about the interactions that closed strings and D brains have, and in particular, because, for example, the graviton couples to a D-brain, right? There's, I mean, there was, we'll see in more detail, there is an interaction between a graviton and the D-brain, just like this. It's, non, it's a non-zero process. That means that these D-brains have some mass, they have some tension. You could consider more complicated processes. Take the D-brain to be like this, and you could bounce off a closed string which is coming off from infinity interacts with your D-brain in some way. 
and then goes off to infinity. So that could be a process involving the scattering of uh, two closed strings of a deep brain or higher order and so on. So this kind of process or this kind of process, you would write an ex we, will, we are going to shortly write down a boundary state for the deep brain. And here we would just put an out state and calculate this process with a propagator. Or if you have two states, well, you could have state one and then a propagator, state two and a propagator and a boundary state. These kinds of processes are going to, so to calculate them, right? I mean, at the level of words, I can, I can draw these pictures. That's fine. But the point is, because we are going to have an exact boundary stage, which tells us exactly what a deep brain is in terms of closed string excitations, that's, it's going to be relatively straightforward to calculate such diagrams. You know, no, no harder than calculating normal perturbative string theory diagrams. Okay, so let's begin. And what we really want to study is closed string moving along and reaching a boundary. What happens there? Well, let's for simplicity take tau, the world sheet time to be zero. And you know, we've got a closed string from zero to two pi. So what happens when you encounter such a boundary in your action? I mean, we are used to encountering spatial boundaries. You know, when you're quantizing the open string, uh, you vary the action, you discover there's the equation of motion. And then there is, because you have to do an integration by parts, there is a, a boundary term, isn't there? So let's just remind ourselves of how this goes. Let's vary the action, which is just equal to e sigma d tau, um, d uh, tau x, d tau delta x. Actually, sorry, I don't think I need this half. Um, minus d sigma x, d sigma h of x. Okay, so integrating by parts in the usual way, we get the bulk world sheet term, which is just the wave equation. And then uh, we get two, right? When we do this integration, we get two boundary terms. So one of them is just going to be the sigma boundary term, which is just d tau x delta x. That's when you do the tau integration. Um, and there is a boundary term in the tau direction, which is just d sigma x delta x. For us, this term here is just equal to zero because um, well, x is periodic, right? So this term here is evaluated at sigma equal to zero and two pi. And because the string is periodic, those two terms cancel. On the other hand, this term need not be zero. And this is the term that we're interested in. Now see here, we cannot, we cannot just uh, declare that there's some cancellation between boundaries because after all, this is the world sheet time coordinate. So we really would like it to vanish separately just for tau equal to zero. So we want this variation to be zero. And you know, I've been sloppy about the indices here. If there's only one X and for now, let's stick just to one X coordinate. There's only two things you can do, right? We can say that d tau x is equal to zero, or we can say that the variation of x is equal to zero. 
and both of these should happen um, at tau equal to zero. Well, this is a perfectly straightforward Neumann boundary condition. Why is it Neumann? Well, a Neumann boundary condition has to do with a normal derivative to the boundary. In other words, in this case, in the tau direction. And this guy here says that the variation of x is equal to zero. So put it another way, we might as well say that instead x at tau equal to zero has got to be zero. And that's just the Dirichlet boundary condition. In fact, we can do a little bit better, right? X doesn't have to be equal to zero. It could be some general constant. Whatever position in space-time, so y is position in target space, which usually will be for us 10 dimensions, or if you're in bosonic string theory, 26 dimensions. Okay. Well, the bulk equation of motion, um, this guy here, the wave equation, just tells us, you can easily check, or we've probably all covered this in your courses in string theory, has the following mode expansion. Let me get all my factors straight. I'm gonna be working more or less in the normalization of green schwartz witten So that's just the momentum, let me call it P0, just so we don't get confused with what it is. P0 and X0 are conjugate to each other. And we have all the modes here. This guy is going to be a function of tau plus sigma. And this guy is going to be a function of tau minus sigma, the left and right movers. can just shrink this a little bit. Okay, there we go. Maybe just not so much. Good. Um, and these run from So you can um, easily check that the modes satisfy the usual commutation relations, namely alpha minus n alpha n is equal to n times, uh, well, let's make it, make this guy an m, delta um, n comma m. There's an exact same relation, commutation relation for the twiddled guys. I didn't remember that somehow, bizarrely, in a lot of string theory, you put the n outside because I guess there are modes of different energies, and so it's just convenient to have this n sitting here. And of course, the x's satisfy x and p um, satisfy the usual uh, commutation relation. I suppose the other thing I should do is now be honest and say that there are going to be all sorts of directions, right? I was doing this for one, uh, for one. The bosonic field, but there's going to be many of them. So let's do like that. I uh, j, and I suppose I really should be writing delta i j here, and I should be writing delta i j. I'm going to be quite sloppy with Minkowski versus Euclidean. Um, it's just not very important for us today. Of course, physically it is very important, but for what I'm doing today, it's not very important. All right, so remember now I have my boundary condition. This one is the Neumann one, and this one is the Dirichlet one. And what I'm going to be after is figuring out what do these boundary conditions mean? What do B, C's, N, and D mean? How can we implement them? Well, actually, it's uh, relatively straightforward to just set 
tau equal to zero in this expression here. And well, let's start with the Dirichlet one, shall we? So the Dirichlet one just says that x at tau equal to zero comma sigma, what's that going to be equal to? Well, I'm plugging in tau equal to zero. So I have x zero i plus i one over n uh, tau equal to zero here. So we have alpha i minus n. Um, I think I have my minus sign uh, the wrong way around here. This should really be sigma minus tau. Alpha i minus n. Um, no, I'm sorry. That's actually okay the way I had it. Tau minus sigma. Um, the positive positive energy modes, the creation energy modes have got to have the same time dependence whether they left or right moving. So what we have here is one over n alpha i minus n e to the i n sigma plus one over n alpha i minus n twiddle e to the minus i n sigma. And this somehow should be equal to what we said here, which was y. And in particular could be yi, depending on each direction. Well, we can rewrite this just a little bit. Remember, this is from n equals one to infinity. So this is the same as x zero i plus i sigma n equals one to infinity, one over n e to the i n sigma alpha i minus n. And here swap the n for minus n. So you get minus alpha twiddle i n. Um, and now this is supposed to equal to yi. How can that happen? Well, it can happen precisely because I've also misspoken. This n is just different from zero. n equals zero to n sorry, and different from zero, all into just positive and negative, right? We, we have both the creation modes and the annihilation modes. All right, so what do we have? We have this condition here. It's supposed to be equal to yi, and this is, of course, supposed to be true for all t. So what that means really is that you better set this guy equal to this guy, while these things, we set them equal to zero. So let's write this down. So remember, this is the Dirichlet boundary condition. And we have x zero i has to be equal to whatever the position you have for the d-brains. And alpha i minus n minus alpha twiddle i n has got to equal zero. So that's what the boundary condition looks like in terms of modes. and for Neumann boundary conditions, I'm going to leave it as an exercise. You're going to find that it's just alpha i minus n um, plus alpha twiddle i n. So it's just a sign difference. So this is for n different from zero. This is also for n uh, different from zero. And in addition here, you get the condition that momentum is equal to zero. Okay, so that'll be an exercise. But that's what uh, the boundary conditions look like. Now, that's all classical, and it was just essentially about solving the wave equation with a boundary at in the tau variable rather than in the um, sigma variable. So normally we would have an open string which would have endpoints at sigma equal to zero and pi. Here instead we had a closed string which is tau equal to zero. All right, how should we impose this in the quantum theory? In 
these boundary conditions in quantum theory. Well, the answer turns out to be the boundary state. So here's how you do this. Um, I guess what I want to do is I want to copy this boundary condition so that you see it. So that we have it here. And we're going to try to find, whoops, no, I don't like it in green. Um, we're going to try to find a boundary state B such that, see this boundary condition, when you act with it on a boundary state, you still get zero. Oops. All right. So I'm going to write down what the boundary state is, and then we'll check that this indeed satisfies that. So here is a boundary state, our first boundary state, alpha minus n, alpha twiddle uh, minus n, acting on the vacuum. So Strictly, I need to put a little label n here just to indicate that this is just for the nth, uh, nth mode. The full boundary state will be a whole product of these guys. So we'll get to that just now. But let's now do carefully the exercise that with this weird looking state, it's called a coherent state, um, this condition is satisfied. So I'm going to take the state alpha n, which is an annihilation operator for n bigger than zero. And you can obviously do it for uh, alpha n as well. I'm dropping for now the superscript i because we don't need it. And we're just going to apply it alpha minus n, alpha minus n twiddle. Zero. Now, how should we calculate this? Well, this is an exponential of some creation operators. What that really means is that you have a sum, k equals zero to infinity, one over n alpha minus n alpha twiddle minus n, all to the power k, one over k factorial, zero. And now what are we gonna do? We're just going to act, try to get this guy, which is an annihilation operator because n is bigger than zero, we're going to try to move it so that it kills the vacuum because, of course, remember alpha n zero is equal to zero. So, of course, this sum, the k equal to zero term, is automatically equal to zero because there are no creation operators, so this guy uh, directly acts on the vacuum. So we might as well start from one to infinity, and then we have a one over k factorial Remember the alphas and the alpha twiddles, they commute with one another. So really all that we're trying to calculate is the following commutator. Right. Because everything else, oh, I better put a K here, and I'm sorry, I meant the tilde here and the untilde there. So why is this true? Well. This term here automatically commutes with alpha twiddle. So it just goes out and it commutes with all the twiddles. So for the purpose of the calculation, it's as good as a C number. And then all you have to do is calculate this guy. Now, this is another exercise that I'm going to leave to you to do. Oh, I've lost my one over n to the k. So this is n to the minus k here. So I'm going to leave this as another exercise to do for next Monday's session. Um, this is just equal to, well, we have a one over n to the k, k factorial. It gives you k. 
And then remember the commutator of one alpha with a, uh, another alpha is n, and you're left with um, k minus one of them. So how can you be roughly sure that this is what happens? Well, look, you have one annihilation operator, you have k creation operators, so the commutator is just going to give you one fewer creation operators, just like in a simple harmonic oscillator. Um, and then because that's the only non-trivial commutator, it's proportional to n, that's just the relations that we had for the alphas in string theory. And the only thing you really have to work out is why it is that there's a factor of k here. So I don't know, maybe a simple induction argument or something like that. All right. So now what's going on? is we can write this as alpha minus n. We're going to pull out one of these alphas outside the sum. And the rest of it, you see 1k cancels here. So we get a k minus 1 factorial. And we get an n to the k minus 1. Um, and everything else looks like this. To the power k minus 1, 0. Right, but once I write it like this, of course, you straight away recognize after shifting the index k to k minus 1, this is the boundary state. And I'm left with alpha minus n. So I've just shown you that alpha twiddle n acting on the boundary state gives you precisely alpha minus n acting on the boundary state. And that's this boundary condition here. So I did it in the Dirichlet case. Of course, you can do it in the Neumann case. And then a boundary state in general is going to consist of, like I said, you're going to have to have boundary conditions um, for, you're going to have coherent states rather, sorry, for um, all excitations, n equals one to infinity. And here I'm going to put in a matrix Sij, Somehow conventionally it's always called S, um, alpha i minus n, alpha j minus n, twiddle acting on the vacuum. And the matrix Sij for us, well, for us, when we were doing the Dirichlet boundary condition, you saw it was plus one. When you do the Neumann boundary condition, it's minus one. And so you have a bunch of minus ones, however many directions you have for a DP brain, and plus ones for all the Dirichlet directions. So typically, this is going to be P plus one of them, and this is going to be nine minus P of them, if you were in superstring theory. Okay, so this is almost the complete boundary state, right? If you want, it was just the product, the n equals one to infinity of these Bn's, nth level boundary states. But I haven't really told you about the zero mode yet, what happens to the position and momentum. And this really is just a, a matter of convention, really, of choosing to write it um, in terms of some uh, localized object, right? So what happens here is, first of all, in the Neumann directions, the momenta are equal to zero, and this state is uh, localized in the transverse Dirichlet directions. So that's quite easily done. All you have to do is do a Fourier transform e to the i k y um, over just, let me write here, k perp, um, k perp, d k perp. So that would be k perp is just a shorthand for k p plus two, k p plus three, uh, all the way up to k nine, number of transverse directions. And what we've really done, right, is we've taken, it, it's more natural for closed string states to be in the momentum basis. And we just took a Fourier transform of it so that we have something that is localized in the position basis. Okay, so at this point, we can ask ourselves, 
Okay. So what we've constructed here is the bosonic boundary state for a D-brain. So this is the bosonic part. a deep brain boundary state. But there is something that uh, we haven't quite fully captured. You know, closed string theory has got this Virasoro symmetry um, and Virasoro generators. And so we might wonder, what do these boundary conditions, N or D boundary conditions, mean for uh, Virasoro symmetry. So that's gonna be our first, uh, our next question rather. Well, let's uh, go back to the boundary condition that we had. And if you remember, so for example, Dirichlet, um, Again, we can leave as an exercise. We can leave as an exercise uh, the Neumann boundary condition. But you remember the Virasoro modes in your course on string theory, which I'm guessing you all had some basic course, where given by a half alpha m minus n, alpha n, um, n equal to minus infinity to plus infinity, a little bit. So remember for m different from zero, this is normal ordered automatically because these modes commute with one another. I'm going to suppress also from for the rest of this uh, little calculation, this index i, uh, just to make the notation a bit more minimal. And what we're going to calculate actually is LM acting on the boundary state using this boundary condition. So what do we get? Well, here's one way you can write it and runs from minus infinity to infinity, alpha N minus N of N boundary state. And now I can use uh, the boundary condition to switch this alpha n mode for an alpha twiddle minus n mode in the boundary state, uh, using the boundary state rather. Alpha m minus n, alpha twiddle n, the boundary state. But equally, I could have done the same thing with my right mover. And let me take the minus right mover. So this is equal to a half sigma n equal to minus infinity to infinity and alpha twiddle. And now I remember I have a minus m here. Okay. And I'm going to, instead of writing minus n, n, I'm going to write plus n alpha twiddle minus n. To remember again for m uh, different from zero. So I better say here, m is different from zero. These two, these two alphas commute with one another, so I can move them around however I want to. And I've also chosen to relabel n to minus n from here to here. Okay, but now all I have to do is again use this boundary condition, uh, but now I'm going to use it on uh, this state, on this uh, alpha. So this is equal to a half, sigma alpha n minus n alpha twiddle minus n boundary and i made a mistake here uh, this should have been a minus n right because an alpha n becomes alpha twiddle minus n a, a, a annihilation operator in one either left left moving will become a right moving creation operator okay so that's what you get. And now you see, of course, these two expressions. The reason I wrote them one underneath each other is that they're equal. So really what's happening is that we have that LM acting on the boundary state 
is equal to L minus M acting on the boundary state, which will. And these are called symmetric or symmetry preserving boundary conditions. Preserving boundary conditions. Because essentially what they tell you is that one uh, linear combination, so one linear combination of T and T bar, or T twiddle rather, sorry, I'm using twiddles for my left and right movers, is preserved. Of course, on the boundary, of you breaking some of your symmetries, uh, that's just inevitable, right? Like if you just have a no normal wave equation and a boundary condition, it ends up in a, in a spatial direction, ends up relating also left and right movers. So you only have one uh, set of independent degrees of freedom. So here it's a little bit similar. And what I'd like you to do as another exercise is to figure out how that equation looks like. In terms of not in terms of modes, so this is this is the mode equation. Um, it actually looks exactly the same for Neumann or Dirichlet boundary conditions. You see, I use the boundary condition um, once here and once here, and so if there was a minus sign, there was in fact a plus sign. Well, that would be exactly the same. In these, you would just get a you'd just get a minus sign in both equations, um, and so this condition would still hold here. So what I'd like you to do is come up with an equation for T and T twiddle um, rather than the modes and use that, use the same symmetry preserving boundary condition to work out uh, boundary states, boundary conditions for ghosts for PC ghosts, for NSR fermions, Psi Psi Twiddle, I guess I should hear BC Twiddle. Um, and if you're feeling particularly energetic, also for the super ghosts. All of which, you know, because you're in a state in super string theory, all of which you need to stick together into the boundary state. So the full boundary state or the full D brain really is a product of the X guy, of the fermions, of the ghosts, and of the super ghosts. And there's some subtleties uh, here that are kind of technical and they're not that important for us, but if you really wanted to write down a proper boundary state, you'd need to get all these things right and to, to use it in uh, string calculations. Okay, so that's, that would be one way in which you could write down this complete boundary state using the fact that the uh, boundary states, d brain boundary states, preserve a linear combination of the Dirac-Sorba algebra. So once you have that, you can, or, or for now we could even just play around with the bosonic boundary state, you can calculate, for example, correlation between, let's say, a particular closed string state. So here is uh, an out state, A, B, and the boundary state. I've chosen a simple uh, state. It just has got one left moving, one right moving excitation. They are level matched. Remember, for a closed string, you need to have the same total level, which is k in both cases here, and I'm keeping the indices a and b general for now. So depending on whether this is a Neumann or Dirichlet boundary condition, you would in fact get the following expression, alpha a k. Remember now the boundary condition would just be something like alpha minus k b, right? This this uh, right moving annihilation operator would become this left moving creation operator and there could be some sign SAB. So for now, let's just go 
for uh, Neumann uh, directions for simplicity. Okay, so I don't have to, I don't have to worry about keeping track of the minus signs. Now, what happens here? Well, this creation operator can just move past this annihilation operator, would give me the vacuum. So this is the same as would annihilate the vacuum on the left. Which is equal to k times zero on the boundary state, which is just k. So this vacuum zero, you could very easily check. Uh, where, do, where do we go? Um, if we go to the to the boundary state here, if you just squish it with a vacuum now um, here. So let me do it in blue. So we know um, all of these this exponential, all the sub successive powers of it, when they would act on this exponential zero, um, they would they would just annihilate it, right? These are creation operators, they're acting on the bra vacuum, so they give you zero. So you just, the only term in this exponential is the one that can contribute, and that gives you the zero. So all of this to say that the coupling between such a state here, such a closed string state, and the D-brain boundary state is non-zero. And look, I also should have written here delta AB, delta AB, and is symmetric. Now, in particular, in bosonic string theory, this state for k equal to one is a graviton. Or an anti-symmetric B-field, more possibly a dilaton. But let's just talk about a graviton and a B-field for simplicity. And what we've shown is that there is such a coupling, but there is no such coupling. Right? I've been, uh, I haven't really done the full super string calculation. I would have to take care of the ghosts and the super ghosts and so on. Um, if I was doing this in super string theory, even bosonic theory, I would also still have to just take care of the ghosts. But all I want to show you here is that there is a non zero coupling to the graviton, but none to the B field. So remember what is in space time the brain action. Well, there's some tension up front. That tension for p plus one well, is just tells you how heavy a deep brain is, essentially per unit volume. And the born in felt action looks like this g mu nu plus b mu nu. Uh, where this is the graviton and this is the NSNS B field. And if you expand this to leading order, um, around Minkowski, so we expand uh, G mu nu is equal to eta mu nu plus um, some fluctuation h mu nu and keep this small then you'll discover that this action has an expansion which is proportional to um, h i i or rather mu mu sorry plus order quadratic so g squared or b squared and so on so the only coupling, so this action, remember, is a space-time action uh, for how the space-time metric and the space-time B-field couple uh, to the deep brain world volume. 
It's not a work, it's not a string theory action, but this leading term, right? The reason that's non-zero is precisely because of this coupling here. Right? We're calculating um, a graviton coupling to the D-brain. This answer is non-zero, and that's precisely what this guy is, and it's non-zero when this is symmetric, right? You get a symmetric contribution. Anything anti-symmetric is equal to zero, and that's because in the DBI action, when you expand it, there is no linear term in B mu nu. Right? If you if you remember, if you have, let's say I was a d particle, this is and I was calculating the determinant of this, um, it would go like one minus b squared, quadratic in b. So this needs to be a minus sign. Um, so the b field only enters at quadratic level, so if we were to do a you know, full course on d brains, we could calculate um, this diagram where this is a, a closed string going off and a closed string coming in. Um, and then that would be non-zero for B fields, but it would be non-zero also for uh, the metric. Whereas the one point function, which is what we calculated uh, just now, well, that's just non-zero for G, but it's zero for a B field. Of course, the D brain couples to all the to many of the closed strings, so not just the massless ones. Right here, this result was true for any state, not just the graviton, k equal to one in balonic theory. Um, so it's a source for all closed strings. Okay, so that's the Horn-Infeld coupling. And one other thing that I'd like to say now is that this normalization here, right, which appears also here, the tension, in other words, the, the weight per unit volume, the mass per unit volume, rather, of a D-brain, um, comes out here in a very implicit way, namely, the tension is related to the normalization of the boundary state. When we constructed the boundary state, we did it without normalization. Right? We just said that alpha n plus or minus alpha minus n equals zero. This is an eigenvalue equation. And any multiple of it, right? Any, sorry, like any good eigenstate, uh, b could be multiplied by six, seven, square root of pi, anything you want, and it would still satisfy. Uh, this boundary condition. And so getting the normalization right will teach us about tension. And as we will see, Ramon Ramon charge of D brain. So I, I threw in the Ramon Ramon charge here because another exercise that you might want to do, and hopefully we'll get to on Monday, um, is to calculate the Ramon Ramon interaction. So we did the NSNS interaction uh, right here, but you could do the Ramon Ramon interaction. So for that, you really need the fermions psi in the Ramon Ramon sector. But a similar sort of calculation will end up telling you that there is a coupling between the P plus one form and the D brain. So that this 
is not equal to zero. And it's the Ramon Ramon potential that actually enters here. And the fact that this is non zero is precisely now in space time, the, not the born infield, but the Vesumino coupling of a T brain looks like this, where this is now its charge density. Um, and this is non zero. This is a differential P plus one form. You integrate it over the volume in P plus one dimensions, so you can do that integral. And if you work a little bit harder, there are actually other couplings. Here's to the NS and S2 form. With a half here, I guess. So let me just write this as B wedge B, which stop at some point, right? Because you run out of, you run out of, the, this number stops being positive. And typically all of this is just written as E to the B. So this is often what the coupling uh, looks like, the Vesumino coupling you often find. So all these couplings are quite easy to compute in string theory from uh, this boundary state formulas. But what we want to do now is we want to figure out um, how to get the normalization right for these deep rates. So because that's going to teach us about the tension. And it's more importantly, it's also going to teach us about the most important property of deep brains, namely um, the connection between open strings and closed strings as related to deep brain. So let's see. That's a very ugly deep brain, isn't it? Let's take a deep brain like this. Let's take a second deep brain like that. And let's get an open, let's get a closed string going between them. So that means we'll have uh, a closed string, uh, sorry, a D brain, a propagator, and a D brain. And well, in, this is a space time picture, but really uh, on the world sheet, what we're doing is we're going to write this propagator using Schwinger parameterization. And my apologies for my factors of 2 pi. I've tried to be consistent. They're not very important, right? This is just the Schwinger parameterization of the propagator going on the world sheet from minus infinity to uh, plus infinity. Okay, so this is what we'd like to calculate. This is uh, because it's a free theory. The propagator is just related to the closed string Hamiltonian. And let me get my conventions here. So it's just equal to a half of P squared plus in the conventions that I'm working in, alpha minus N alpha N plus alpha twiddle minus N alpha twiddle minus N. Um, N equals one to infinity. I've normal ordered this now, right? This is just L zero minus one or minus whatever the, um, whatever the, uh, correct value of uh, the intercept is for a uh, superstring. So for us, it's going to be equal to minus, this is going to be equal to minus one. Okay. And we'd like to calculate this diagram. So before I do that, let me just pause and, 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 and say, if you were computing an analogous calculation, for example, in some kind of theory with solitons or instantons or something, so so I guess uh, more solitons than instantons, but let's let's say that you were in some gauge theory and you had some instanton here and, an, and another instanton at a different location, and you tried to compute their interaction, right? Because this is essentially what we're doing. We've got these non-perturbative objects and we're trying to figure out what happens, how do they interact with one another, interact by the exchange of the closed strings that they source. That would be an extremely hard calculation. You could only hope to do it in some kind of perturbative expansion. Namely, you know, you would just say, okay, only the lightest states here 
uh, I will consider the interaction of just a single latest state. But in string theory, we'll be able to do this for all uh, closed string exchanges for any mass. And it will be completely easy for us. Right? Normally, what you would do is you would use the mass, something that suppresses, that becomes smaller and smaller. So you'd ignore all the higher order terms. But here we can do this calculation exactly. And that's one of the kind of special things about the simplicity of D-Box. So what I want to compute, so for now, let me just concentrate on the nth node. There's going to be a whole product of such combinations. And for now, I'm going to just do the calculation for uh, the nth one. Okay. Now remember, what are my boundary states? Well, the nth node boundary state. And again, I'm just going to do this for, uh, let's say, a Dirichlet boundary condition. If it was Neumann, the sign here would change, but it would be quite analogous. Um, alpha n, alpha twiddle n to the power L. Oh, I'm sorry. That's just all it is, isn't it? There's nothing else. Then I have this pre factor here, e to the minus 2 pi L, alpha minus n, alpha n, plus alpha twiddle minus n, alpha twiddle minus n, and another factor of alpha minus n, alpha twiddle minus n, zero. Right here, I have the annihilation operators. Here, I have the creation operators. Okay. In order to make progress with this, the simplest thing to do is expand all the exponentials. So I'm going to have k, l, and m all running from 0 to infinity. And I'm going to have 1 over n alpha n alpha n twiddle to the power k over k factorial minus 2 pi l alpha minus n alpha n plus a twiddle minus n alpha twiddle minus n. Um, all of this is going to be to the power, oh, I better not use the letter L, let's use the letter um, R, um, over R factorial, and here we have a 1 over N alpha minus N alpha twiddle minus N to the power M over M factorial zero. Okay, I've just expanded the exponentials. And now what's going on? Well, how many creation operators do I have? Um, well, I have m here and m left and m right. And here I have r. It doesn't really matter how I expand but I have R of them. And um, then how many annihilation operators do I have? Well, I have K of them here and I have R of them here. So in total, I have 2K plus R annihilation. And I have 2m plus r creation, right? Left and right. And so if you imagine squishing this between the vacuum, the only way that will be non-zero is if these numbers match up, right? If you have a different number of creation operators and different number of annihilation operators, that'll always give you zero. And so the first thing that we learn is that m has got to be equal to k independently of this r. So now this whole expression can be written as 0, sigma. Um, so let's just get rid of one of these. And let's write them like this. So we have 1 over k factorial. m factorial is the same, so that's squared. 
n to the power minus k minus m, so it's n to the power 2 uh, k. And now we have alpha n, alpha n twiddle to the power k. Um, now I can also put the r factorial outside here and the minus 2 pi l, let's do that. Um, to the power r. And here we have, well, we have almost number operators, don't we? If our um, alphas were normalized like normal, um, like normal uh, harmonic oscillator creation and annihilation operators, then these would be number operators. But there's an extra factor of n in the canonical commutation relations compared to compared to um, simple harmonic oscillator. So when you are calculating one of these guys, see, that's kind of like a, if I, if I normalized it like this, this would be the number operator for the nth mode. And so then if it were acting on a state like this, it would just, this operator would just count um, how many of the creation operators there are. In this case, uh, I keep writing m here, but I should actually write k, right? Because we've set m equal to k. So let me just change that. Okay. And all this guy here is doing is, is counting how many creation operators of that mode there are. There are k of them. So this is just equal to um, 1 over n k alpha minus n alpha n twiddle to the power k. Sorry, no 1 over n. It's counting the number. This is the, this is the um, number operator. There are so many of them. So you can, that's, that's the quick argument. You can check explicitly also, uh, if you don't like the number operator argument, you can just calculate in a similar fashion to one of the exercises that you get this expression. Of course, what we have here is not alpha minus n, alpha n with a one over n. We really need to take this one over n and put it here. Um, and it's that expression that we can then use to simplify the next line. So this, okay, I'm going to write here minus 2 pi L to the R K factorial squared and to the power 2 K R factorial. I'm just repeating what I had before. Zero, I'm doing nothing to the bra state. And here I get K N. And here I also get K N. Right, this was done for a left moving guy and the right moving guy is exactly the same. So I get this. Okay, well, look what's happening. Now we can take out this term and all the R dependents and do that sum separately. Right, this is a sum for k and r, but I could just as well have written k equals uh, 0 to infinity sigma r equals 0 to infinity minus 2 pi l to the power r. And here there's 2 kn. Sorry, let's put that guy inside the bracket as well. Um, so this is going to be... Uh, 2kn to the power r divided by r factorial. That's all the r dependents. And then we have 1 over k factorial squared n to the power 2k. And what am I left with here? Well, I'm just left with the following. Right, left and right movers commute. So you just have two of these factors. This, of course, is just 
an exponential, right, of all of this stuff. So I'm going to write it as conventional to write this as q to the power, um, what do we have? 2kn, where q conventionally is e to the minus 2 pi l. L. Okay, now we're almost there. Final exercise that you can do is to discover that this is just equal to k factorial n to the power k. Um, again, probably induction would be a very simple way to do it. It's probably other ways too. So all of this stuff, right, you get one factor like that and a second one which is exactly the same and it cancels this. And so what you are left with really is just the following expression. So that's the kind of nitty gritty calculation that I wanted to show you. Now we can start putting everything um, together. This calculation is the exchange of the nth mode between two deep brains. Now we're gonna sum up all of those um, So we've done the nth, the calculation for the nth node. Let's now also work out the zero mode, uh, which is just the momentum in the directions transverse to the deep brain. So the simplest uh, case to do is if we set the, both deep brains in space to be sitting right on top of each other at position, transverse positions zero, the only part of the Hamiltonian that um, we need to worry about is this p squared piece. Remember it was p squared over two, and so that cancels the two that we had uh, in uh, from the Schwinger parameterization. And here is my other boundary state also at y equal to zero. But all I need, right, is just the zero mode part which remember was just a Fourier transform. So what we have really is nine minus P K, second one for the one for each of the bra and the cat. Let's call it K prime. Um, e to the minus pi L P squared K. And because they're at positions y equal to zero, there is no, uh, in the Fourier transform, there's no phase factor. So this is of course just d k d k prime um, e to the minus pi. Well, this operator p, I guess I had a zero on there before, the operator p zero acts on the k, you, and it just becomes p l k squared. And then you have um, the momentum mode k prime and the momentum mode k, so this is just delta k minus k prime. You can do the k prime integral, that's just eliminates it, right? The delta function eliminates it, and then you just left with a Gaussian integral um, for k. And I guess I checked this, it is. 1 over square root of L, 9 minus P, because there are 9 minus P of these integrals, 9 minus P of both of them. Okay. As an exercise, uh, I will leave doing the calculation when Y uh, is different from Y prime, different from zero. And the answer in that case for the same, so if I do Y prime B, the zero mode part of it, e to the minus pi p squared l, uh, b y, zero mode, uh, gives you, well, the same Gaussian factor. Um, so let's, sorry. Um, 
L to the power nine minus P over two uh, times E to the minus delta Y squared. Let's get the factors, all the other factors correct, divided by four pi L. So delta Y is just Y minus Y prime. An exercise to do. So let's put everything together. So the cylinder for the complete bosonic mode when um, in our theory will look like this. We've got our integral, the length of the cylinder on the world sheet. We've got, for now, I'm not going to do this momentum integral. You'll see just now uh, why I'm doing that. There is a Q to the power C, this, um, this guy that I call 2 pi C, um, plus K squared over 2. And that's this, uh, this guy here. And then I have a product of all the different massive modes. And remember, each massive mode gave us one of these factors, and now I'm doing a product of them. So notice, I'll shortly get rid of this um, k integral, but I left it in here because if you expand out this product, you are going to get things that look roughly like q to the power minus one. Hey, I'm a little um, not worried about the factor of factors of pi at the moment, k squared over two plus some integer, uh, let's call it, M. This, remember Q was e to the minus 2 pi L. So this is like a pole for an on-shell closed string state. And that really, uh, this, this way of thinking about this diagram is very helpful, right? You have a cylinder that really becomes an exchange of a closed string, mth, close, mth level closed string, or as, as close string whose level is m, and you know, this diagram, I've expanded this, just kept this term, so really there's some sort of huge sum over all possible mth level strings and, and then over all possible levels m. So there'll be quite a lot of these. And I guess the other thing I needed to do here was that um, there will be actually eight of these. I'll come back to that point just now. But you're exchanging a closed string. So there's going to be in your diagram as a pole if you just pick the transverse momenta to be just right. Um, and this cylinder amplitude is really a sum of all those diagrams. Now why eight? Eight because there are 10 uh, closed string directions. We derived this just for a Dirichlet direction, but you can check that for a Neumann direction, it comes out exactly the same. Um, and the bosonic BC ghosts give you minus two powers of this. Okay, so that's one of those sub more subtle calculations. It's not very difficult actually, because the BC ghost system is fermionic, so doing these calculations is a little bit simpler for fermions but it turns out that it precisely removes two of the 10 uh, bosons, which is what you would expect, right? Normally you have eight on shell bosonic. Uh, when, when you're counting the number of closed string states, the ghosts typically remove the two light cone coordinates. Okay, so let's now do this integral over k, 
So the cylinder expression is just going to be dl, um, l to the power p minus 9 over 2. Right? Remember, this is just doing a Gaussian integral. For each Gaussian direction, you get a 1 over square root of l. The factors of pi hopefully work out. And what you're left with then is actually a dedicated eta function to the power minus 8 to i l. So here you can check with definition of dedicandita function. And the one place where I have to be a little bit sloppy is that the C, which for us has been minus one, should really be thought of minus eight over 12 for the bosons and minus four over 12 for the fermions, world sheet fermions, which I have been ignoring. So I can't use the full C here. I just have to use the bosonic C for eight bosons and, and miss out the fermions. Of course, you can repeat this calculation and include the fermions, include the um, uh, ghosts and super ghosts, and then all these factors are gonna work out. But I think uh, given the time, we're probably not going to be able to do that uh, today. So now there is this nice relationship that the dedekind eta function satisfies. It's another thing that we could try to prove in the exercise session if people are interested. Um, let me get all my factors right. Eta minus 1 over tau is equal to square root of minus i tau um, eta tau. So that's one of those amazing things because the dedicated eta function is really defined on a torus. This is one of the SL2 transformations on the torus. So let's use that and let's define a coordinate t equals 1 over 2l. So this integral becomes dt over 2t squared. This becomes 2t to the power 9 minus p over 2. And if you get all your factors right here, um, you are going to get uh, t to the power, uh, what is it, uh, 4. Um, Mm -hmm. That they can eat a function evaluated at it, and there's going to be minus eight of them. So putting all of this together, you get okay some prefactor. Hopefully, I've got this one right. Doesn't really matter for now. The level of what we're doing. It's very important if you try to do the calculation very precisely. Um, this is t to the power minus p plus 1 over 2, um, q twiddle to c again, 1 over product 1 over 1 minus q twiddle uh, to n, where q twiddle um, is defined as e to the minus pi t. Okay, so if you play a little bit with the factors of i here, um, that so this is just usually the way that the dedicated data transformation S transformation is, is listed. So I'm keeping it like that. So if you want to look it up, um, you can match it. And now this expression here is supposed to be precisely the partition function um, for an open string stretching between the two D rings. Oops. because when we've made this transformation, we've really gone from a cylinder to an annulus. 
And what we're calculating here is the partition function for an open string that stretches between these two d-brains. And the thing about partition functions is, well, let's expand this, okay? So this is equal to some number. Don't worry about the number too much. Here's my measure. And here is 2t to the power minus p plus 1 over 2. q twiddle to the c. Now let's expand. 1, uh, if you do this correctly, it's 1 plus 8. Oh, I'm sorry, I've forgotten again power of 8 here. q twiddle squared plus 44 q twiddle to the power 4 plus 192 q twiddle to the power 6 and so on. Right? You have an expansion in this q twiddle and all of these guys are positive integers. And this prefactor here is just the Gaussian integral. So this is just Gaussian over p plus one momenta. Right, the open strings that end on a dp brain have got um, momenta in the p plus one directions. That's where translation is not broken. And doing each one of those is a very similar calculation to what we just did with the Gaussian integral and you, you pick up such a factor. So this really is the partition function. And notice that this eight, well, what states are these? These are just the eight transverse uh, states of this form. At level two, there are eight of these states but there are also, this is now symmetric, 36 of those, so this is eight, this is eight plus 36 equals 44. And why don't you check whether 192 works out with these states. Now I'm counting here just in light cone directions, I is equal to one through to eight, uh, so the transverse directions to the light cone, I'm ignoring zero and nine, um, you could either work in light cone gauge or you could figure out that the bosonic, con that the ghosts will cancel two of the, will cancel two of these etas that you would, so you normally have 10 of these etas and two of them would get canceled uh, by the BC ghosts. So the number of physical degrees of freedom is just captured by the close, uh, by the uh, transverse eight coordinates. And that's the point of the partition function, right? It counts the number of these states and they better be positive integers. But throughout, right, I have suppressed, I have suppressed, ignored the normalization of my boundary state, right? This boundary state that we talked about was obtained as a eigenfunction equation, and we never figured out what the right normalization is. The right normalization is n such that we have one open string for one d brain. Um, if we had a two d brains, then we would have n would go become two, so n squared, which is what enters the partition function, right? So this we, we essentially showed this very nice result is equal to trace um, e to the minus t h open. So now if we doubled the boundary states, so let's say I took a 
two and two, then I would have four of these open strings. That would be exactly right, because I would have um, two D-brains on top of each other now, and you could have open string one, open string two, open string three, and flowing the other direction, open string four. So I'm not going to obviously calculate here the exact value that you need for this normalization n, um, but it is, uh, you can calculate it, and this is uh, the best way to find out what, how, to, how to get the tension right uh, and the Ramon-Ramon charge right of the D-brain. So let me summarize. We constructed a coherent state in closed string theory. We showed that um, it is a source of closed strings. And of naturally, which encodes this diagram, right? It's the, the boundary state, the D brain boundary state um, encodes uh, the, the coupling of a single closed string to the boundary. But also, we studied the interaction interaction between two D brains. In the cylinder diagram, and showed that it's exactly the same as the partition function of an open string stretching between them. So this is D1, this is D2, D1 and then D2 here. And the tension and Ramon-Ramon charge, which comes from these one-point couplings to massless states, is determined as the minimal uh, normalization of B um, in, in this diagram here. So we have N squared um, if this is normalized as N and this is normalized as N. Um, and so we didn't really talk about the Ramon-Ramon charge very much, but maybe we'll get to it in the exercises. But in any case, the tension is the coupling, right, to the, to the graviton that we saw was non-zero. Obviously, if you vary the normalization of your uh, boundary state, you change the tension. But because this goes in discrete units, because of uh, integer number of open strings. So you might like to, now some exercises you might like to do besides the ones I already mentioned. So you might like to calculate the diagram between a DP and a DQ brain, where P and Q are not the same. And you could, for example, show that um, 
this is zero for q equal to p minus four. Um, it's a little bit harder to show it for uh, q equal to p minus eight um, when they differ by eight, but in both of these cases, the vanishing of this is a sign. It also does vanish actually for p equal q. It's a sign of supersymmetry in spacetime. In other words, there's the same number of bosons and fermions in the open string spectrum. open string spectrum. Um, and so to do that, of course, you can't just do it for bosons. You have to do it for, um, you have to have it for the full boson and fermion theory. So you, you have to do a previous exercises on getting, getting the boundary state for psi. Um, another thing that you can try to do is what is, boundary state for a deep brain at an angle. In other words, um, one that goes like this, if this is some direction x1, and this is some direction x2, and this is some angle theta, can you write down a boundary state depends on this angle theta. So you have something that is Neumann here and Dirichlet here. Um, hopefully you can do that without too much work just by thinking about rotating your coordinate system and what that might look like explicitly in terms of the boundary state. Okay, so I think I'll, con I'll finish here. Um, I'm going to hang around on Slack um, for the next week. So if you have questions uh, before the tutorial or after the tutorial, you can also post them on Slack. Um, and uh, let's, let's leave it there. <laughs>